Ah, hello. It's time for philosophy of the paranormal. We're going to talk about dreams today. And I need to let some people into the class if we're going to do that. Ah, here we go. All right. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, obviously, we'll wait a little bit because uh, we've still got two more minutes before class begins. And we only have uh, the four of us here so far. So, let's let everybody. In. No, it's not let everybody come in. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even have to not let everyone in. I don't. I don't know if the turnout's going to be too big today from the looks of things, but that's okay. Maybe they're like actively engaged in material and they're all sleeping right now. It could be. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. Bonus points if you have a cool dream while you're supposed to be in class about dreams. <laughs> all right, there's Alexis. All right, so one more minute. We'll wait one more minute. How's everyone else doing today? Or seven. Let's see if get anybody talking. Yeah, get some conversation going. Well, I'm fine. I I I don't uh, I don't sleep well these days, which is I guess somewhat ironic uh, for the topic. Andrea's tired. It's a tired. Yeah, tired Tuesday. We should just call it that because it's after Monday, and Monday sucks. Let's see. Well, it's 2.35 now, so we may as well begin. Um, I have my slow computer, of course, so uh, uh, maybe some people will show up while I'm doing this. I added a couple more potatoes, so it should uh, be a little faster today, but uh, I don't know. Oh, maybe not. It's a little starchy. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I tried your sweet potato with the cinnamon. Oh, yeah? Fantastic. Yeah. Very it's not fantastic. bad, right? Yeah. And if yeah. you slice them thin, you know, they don't get crispy, but they get, like, nice. Yeah. Almost, like, like chewy, almost. I, I don't know, man. I like them. They're really good. It reminds me of autumn. Yeah. I still want to hold on to summer for now. Yeah. 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 If you mix that up with some squash and some pumpkin or something, I bet that would be pretty awesome. Like all roasted. Oh, man. Anyway, <laughs> I better stop talking about food. Um, uh, okay, dreams and dreaming today. This is fun. This is a fun one for me because um, uh, this is actually one of the areas that I would say... Uh, resulted in me getting sucked into uh, philosophy and cognitive science. So when I was a teenager, I read a lot about uh, dreams, um, some bunk, uh, but some science as well. And uh, that was a good early experience because it helped me to uh, just as a young sort of uh, inquiring mind uh, to sort of um, learn how to navigate between science and pseudoscience. Um, which was cool. It went, it went, on a matter of luck, really, I could have gone the other way if I hadn't had access to, um, you know, good sources. And even the good sources had 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 their share of, uh, you know, uh, flim flam. But we'll talk about that later. Another reason why this is interesting for me is because this is probably the one example in this class of something that's paranormal that's or that was considered paranormal or supernatural that is no longer considered uh, so by the scientific community. Uh, ESP and psi and those things are of course um, still doubted and rightly so because of, as we've seen issues with replicability, uh, issues with um, fraud and data manipulation. Uh, cryptozoology again 
scientists are uh, scientists are open to the possibility of identifying new species of animals, and of course, uh, discovering species that we thought to be extinct, like the coelacanth. You know, that's that's perfectly plausible, but that's not cryptozoology. Um, <clears throat> So cryptids like Bigfoot, the Loch Ness Monster, are still treated with extreme skepticism. Uh, let's see, what else have we covered? Um, well, ghosts um, uh, and mediumship and that kind of thing is pretty much the same as with uh, other areas of parapsychology. But with dreams, dreams, it's very interesting because today we're going to talk about something um, uh, that was long relegated to that sort of, uh, you know, the, para the parapsychology pile, we could call it. And those are lucid dreams. Those are dreams during which you know that you are having a dream. There's still some debate over whether these count as uh, conscious states or altered states of consciousness, perhaps. Um, but what's not in doubt is the fact that they happen, uh, which for reasons we'll get into today, uh, was, again, treated with extreme skepticism um, right up until the 70s and 80s. So uh, not, not that long ago. And dreams are um, also very cool to talk about because if we understand how the dreaming brain works, let's, let's move myself out of the way here, we can understand uh, the workings of the dreaming brain and the differences between the dreaming and the waking brain, we could do something else that's really cool. We could identify potentially the neural correlates of consciousness. What are the neural correlates of consciousness? I wonder if any of you have heard this term before. No? Oh, it's, it's, uh, it's, um, it's a pretty straightforward idea. Right. Uh, in this class, we've already learned a little bit about materialism, uh, which is a kind of substance monism. And we contrast this with dualism, uh, like substance dualism, like that of Rene Descartes, where the mind is um, a separate substance, a distinct substance from the body. Now, on monism, it's assumed that um, there's a few different ways you can look at it, but uh, I guess the most straightforward way of putting it is that the mind is not a different substance on substance monism. It can't be. There's only one substance. So the mind is just what the brain does. We still have lots of things that we need to explain there, like how does subjective consciousness arise out of this meat machine in my skull? Um, but one of the ways we might figure that out is by identifying the neural correlates of consciousness. So what are the physical events in the brain? that correspond or correlate with conscious events. So for example, if I feel pain, what neurons are firing, right? Uh, it's probably to use the, the, that shop-worn example, my C fibers will fire if I'm in pain, right? Um, and we've made a little bit of headway with this uh, already. Not, it's not like we have an understanding of subjective consciousness yet, but uh, we know, for example, that the visual cortex um, has what we call a retinotopic organization. So you have neurons on your retina. These are uh, little, little retinal neurons that transduce electromagnetic energy, visible light into neural signals, and they go to your visual cortex. But the map, the map as it were, the pattern of, of uh, photoreceptors on your retina is sort of flipped and reversed on your visual cortex such that, um, and this is a very simple example, if I were looking at a circle, for example, uh, if you had a machine with the right spatial and temporal resolution, you could see something that looks like a circle uh, in terms of the, uh, uh, not maybe not literally, but you'd see the corresponding neurons fire. It's not as straightforward as it sounds because these neurons are arranged in these like pinwheel-like columns. So it's not an exact map, but it, it is sort of corresponding with the layout of the cells on the retina in terms of neural activity. So that's one example of the neural correlates of consciousness. I can report a visual experience um, and we could see which neurons were firing in the visual cortex and in the, um, 
the retinal cells, the retinal ganglion cells and all of that stuff. And that's good because remember, um, this chapter is from Blackmore and what Blackmore's project is all about is understanding consciousness. So that would be cool. And we could also maybe understand um, or deepen our understanding of what we mean when we're talking about conscious versus unconscious states, right? Um, we're not gonna get to the bottom of either of these today, but they're interesting things to keep in mind. So we don't just study dreams because they're you know, neat or interesting or, or mysterious, but they might actually help us to understand our, our waking experience, our conscious experience, uh, and figure out how all of that might work. And that's pretty cool. But what are dreams in the first place? Here are some answers you might find if you did a quick web search. Um, the Google Dictionary defines a dream as a series of thoughts, images, and sensations occurring in a person's mind during sleep. It's pretty straightforward. Um, it doesn't mention REM sleep, though, rapid eye movement sleep, which is where most dreams occur. Wikipedia will give you a slightly more precise definition. A dream is a succession of images, ideas, emotions, and sensations that usually occur involuntarily in the mind during certain stages of sleep. Predominantly REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. And most of the other definitions that you'll find in a textbook or on the internet will agree with those. Um, so these are pretty much, yeah, I'd say, okay, these are good. They could be a little bit more precise, but then again, it's Wikipedia and Google Dictionary, so I'm not really surprised. As I mentioned, uh, most dreams occur during the stage of sleep that we call REM sleep, rapid eye movement. And of course, this stage of sleep is characterized uh, in addition to the sort of rapid eye movements that you can see under um, a sleeping person's eyelids. Uh, also by paralysis. So something happens in the brain stem when you're in REM sleep that prevents motor signals um, or inhibits them substantially such that they don't cause you to get up and act out your dreams, right? Um, the exceptions other than the eyes would be the heart and the lungs. Um, if you read the chapter from Blackmore, you'll probably have encountered some of those interesting experiments that they do with dreaming subjects where um, they will, uh, yeah, they can measure all kinds of physiological, um, well, all kinds of phys physiological measures can be taken in a sleep lab. Um, so for example, uh, there was one experiment they did where they had people do squats in, in a dream. They had some lucid dreamers come into the sleep lab, uh, okay, I'm dreaming. And then they'd start to do an experiment. They had to do 10 squats. And uh, it was found that their heart rate and respiration uh, went up just as if they were exercising, uh, if they were awake. And not only that, but the, the activity in the muscles. So in, in like your, your quads, for example, would have been uh, similar that you would have seen them twitching, but you wouldn't have actually been moving because again, you've got an inhibition of motor activity. Uh, Jean-Francois, go ahead. Isn't that the part where the, uh, the rats as well, they measured the rats and they would like measure them when they were uh, running on a treadmill or something like that. And then yeah. they found that the brain, the, the same areas of the brain were being activated. Yeah, that, yeah. so what they, that one was really cool. What they were yeah. doing was running a maze. They trained them to run a maze and uh, they had some uh, electrodes hooked up, uh, probably these would be like single unit recorders or patch clamps or something. Um, they, I don't think Blackmore says the area that they were connected to, but I'm going to, I'm going to guess it was the hippocampus. Um, but that spatial I, memory. Yeah. Yeah. Spatial memory. Yeah. So, um, maybe it was the hippocampus, but, uh, what they were able to do having, observed the brain activity of the rats running the maze when they were awake. Um, when they observed the activity of the dreaming rats, after they had run the maze, they would dream about running the maze. And from the brain activity, they were actually able to map out where in the, uh, the maze or the, the racetrack or whatever it was, where the rat was dreaming that it was. And that's another great example. That's neural correlates of consciousness, right? 
Um, so that's very cool. Uh, but the rats, of course, wouldn't have been running around. They would have been like kind of twitching. Like when you see your pet dreaming, you know, you see your dog or a cat dreaming or whatever critter you have. If it's a mammal that probably dreams. Um, our brains are also pretty active when we're in REM sleep. Um, almost the same as uh, when we're awake. And you'd observe a lot of the same kinds of activity as when you're awake. If you were to examine a dreaming brain with an EEG, which of course we, we've, we've done this for decades. Uh, this is how we came to identify the stages of sleep. Uh, your dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex is active, but a little bit less active than when you're awake. And that's interesting because this is um, implicated in executive control, critical thinking, and that kind of thing, which might be why we don't notice when our dreams are so weird while we're dreaming. But um, other areas of the frontal cortex are, are much less active. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, no, yeah, no. Um, it's the other way around. <laughs> they got it backwards. Um, there is some uh, activity. There's a, there's a great chart in Blackmore in this chapter that shows the areas that are less active versus more active when we're awake versus when we're asleep. And it's true that the dreaming brain is almost as active as the waking brain, but there are some areas that are not as active. And that's probably why we don't realize what, what's, what's dream like about our dreams while we're dreaming, right? But that's Inception, you know. Um, it's just a movie, right? So um, also in dreamings, we see a lot of thalamocortical loop activity. You see in the brain, um, you have this um, uh, nucleus, uh, a group of cells. Actually, it's made up of several nuclei, which are like collections of cells um, called the thalamus. And what the thalamus seems to do is um, <clears throat> act as a sort of... Uh, I don't know if I want to say it's like a way station, um, but information, let's go back to the example of the, the visual cortex. You know, if I have information going uh, in, in through my optic nerves to my visual cortex, well, it doesn't just go straight back there. It goes to the thalamus, then to the visual cortex, and from the visual cortex through the striate cortex back to the thalamus. Um, and it's like this all over the brain. So uh, what the thalamus might be doing is sort of be like an oscillating coordinator of brain activity. I know that's kind of weird, but that's kind of what the brain, the brain is massively parallel. And maybe the thalamus is kind of keeping things together in terms of uh, uh, promoting what neuroscience call, not neuroscientists call oscillatory synchrony. Um, I don't really have time to get into that stuff now. Um, but I'm teaching a neuroscience class in the winter. So I guess if you're curious, you could always take a neuroscience class with me. And that's also interesting because these thalamocortical loops seem to be important for conscious experience, of course. So the stages of sleep. Well, you start off as you do awake, and then you begin to fall asleep and you might have a very short dream a very brief period of REM sleep. Between this, you're probably going to see what we call hypnagogic imagery. So let's start, let's uh, think about the last time we were falling asleep and maybe you were sleepy and you weren't paying much attention, but, but maybe one, one, one time or another, you've noticed that you're seeing these uh, weird floaty images in front of your eyes as you're falling asleep. Has anyone ever noticed that? Oh, you'll have to keep an eye out for it then. Sometimes these can be like geometric patterns. Sometimes they can be like weird clouds. Uh, for me, they kind of go back and forth between very structured images and unstructured images. And these are called uh, hypnagogic images. So hypnagogic comes from the Greek, which means leading into sleep. And they're just images that we see as we're closing our eyes and 
I'm falling asleep. If you're curious, uh, you know, try it the next time you're going to bed or you're taking a nap, just try and lie still and clear your mind. And uh, you may begin to see just weird abstract imagery. Uh, that's hypnagogic imagery. Then you might hit a very brief period of REM sleep where you, you may have a uh, short dream. Um, I often have a short dream here, like if I'm having a nap and I hit REM sleep right away, um, I could have a dream where it often happens to me where I'm walking and I trip. And then just before I hit the ground, I wake up. And I find that I wake up like, bah! like uh, I ha I've had what's called a myoclonic jerk. So your brain is an interesting, uh, your brain is interesting. It's, um, Hmm. <coughs> yeah, I'll come back to this. This is a, this is actually Andrea. This is an important, um, an important point that, that, that I'll, I'll come back to in a moment. Um, if you ever find yourself having woken up like that, like you just seem to be like jolted awake, that's called a myoclonic jerk. Um, so I'll spell some of these things out in the chat. So we first we had hypnagogic imagery. And then we had a myoclonic jerk. A muscle jerk, a sudden muscle jerk. Your brain uh, sometimes gets uh, confused and it thinks that you're dying when you're falling asleep, your body is shutting down. So it'll wake it up. And that's what a myoclonic jerk is. Then you start falling asleep into deep sleep. You go down through different stages of sleep where the brain waves start to change. If we're recording your brain waves with an EEG, we'll see changes as you get to deep sleep, which is slow wave sleep. So named for the slow waves that we see on an EEG machine. Um, dreams can happen here, uh, but they tend to be uh, thought-like. They are not like REM dreams, which are full of images and sounds and uh, narratives and actions, right? So you enter deep sleep and you'll stay there for a bit and come back up to REM sleep at the end of your first sleep cycle, and you'll have a short dream. And this repeats four or five times a night. Uh, such that each uh, at the end of each cycle, uh, you dream, you spend more time in REM sleep. And it can even get to where if you are sleeping in, you can have quite long dreams, 30 or 40 minutes. Um, you can also wake yourself up, um, say after your fourth cycle, stay up for an hour, go back to sleep, and you'll still have a long dream. And many people will do this, they'll wake up, uh, do some kind of lucid dreaming activity and go back to sleep and try to recognize that they're dreaming in, in their long dream here because there's more time for, I guess, more dreamlike stuff to happen. Uh, go ahead. Oh, I think you're muted. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> As a psych out. <laughs> Make it, um when in the readings blind people or people who are born blind they were said to dream more with thoughts and words than they were with images obvious for obvious reasons uh, but um, also okay. also textures okay. um okay. touch motion right right um yeah. and REM sleep would still have those things right okay yeah cool um thank you yeah no problem uh let's see so sometimes, as, 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 uh, as we mentioned, sometimes dreams do occur in non-REM sleep, like deep sleep, but they're not as vivid, they're more thought-like, um, and they're much harder to recall. If I wake you up from non-REM sleep, I think Blackmore's example goes something like, you know, I wake you up in the sleep lab and you'll be like, oh, I was just thinking about uh, so-and-so, I need to uh, get in touch with uh, what's-his-face, because I was thinking about them, right? But if you wake someone up during REM sleep, they will say, uh, oh, I was having this crazy dream and you were there and you were there, and, you know, one of those, right? Like Wizard of Oz style. Um, 
uh dreams are very difficult to recall from non-rem sleep too oftentimes if i'm woken up from non-rem sleep i'm just like talking nonsense um uh sometimes my partner will hold a conversation with me where where and and it's word salad it doesn't make any sense it's like i have aphasia it's 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 very strange i don't know if this has happened to any of you but yeah like uh what was one one was how you know the pants turn into something else if you look at them under the microscope and and so my girlfriend's like what are you talking about i'm like the pants the pants like and like why don't you understand <laughs> so that that's your your non-rem sleep type of brain right there not very sharp um now uh back to andrea's point that she made in in the chat um andrea said i remember my dreams when i've woken up fallen asleep again and wake up again yeah um Dreams in REM sleep are also difficult to recall if you haven't woken up directly from the dream. And there could be really good adaptive reasons why that is, which we'll look at in a moment. Um, humans aren't the only creatures that dream. You've seen your pets dreaming, no doubt. If you have pets, your dog or your cat, you can tell when they're in deep sleep, when they're lying still and their breathing is slow and regular, but when they get all twitchy, that's REM sleep. Um, we know that birds uh, also uh, probably dream. Um, dolphins, interestingly, don't seem to dream. Um, the reason is that uh, dolphins' brains sleep one half at a time. So brains, all, all brains are divided into two hemispheres. So humans have this. We have a right and left cerebral hemisphere, and so do dolphins. But because dolphins are uh, aquatic mammals, they have to keep swimming and keep breathing. They breathe air, right? They're not like fish. So, um, you know, only one half of the brain can sleep at a time. Uh, and for this reason, it's they don't, they're not thought to dream. And that's right. Reptiles, I don't think dream either. Um, at least we can say that they don't uh, undergo REM sleep, right? Um, but this is interesting. So of the animals that do go through REM sleep, uh, how can we say that they're dreaming? After all, they can't tell us, right? So, so on what grounds are we making this assumption that just because, say, like my dog over here um, goes into REM sleep and I see her twitching and barking a little bit and uh, as if she's having a dream where she's doing some dog stuff, like going for a walk in the park. Um, but am I justified in making that leap? I'm just curious. I'm just curious. I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. I'm just curious what everyone's thoughts are. I mean, we always tend to base uh, others' actions based on our own. But uh, I think this is valid. I mean, they're showcasing similar uh, properties that we exhibit. and. Uh, yeah, that's my take on it. Yeah. yeah. There's a, a very interesting video you can see and 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 I'll I'll put a bit of a trigger warning because it it does involve surgically altering animals, but uh there were experiments uh that um did, where they did brain surgery on cats to prevent the inhibition from the dreaming brain and the cats seemed to get up and walk around and act out their dreams. Uh, even though they were still asleep. Uh, so it seems like they're not just twitching zombies to me. Um, there's actually some kind of dream happening. Uh, but, but again, we can't ask them. Uh, Daniel had his hand up. Uh, go ahead, Daniel. I was going to say something similar about like how, you know, we should examine that part of the brain or if they have that part of the brain like that in normally inhibits your motion while you're asleep yeah and, and 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 i believe the video clip from this experiment is is findable on youtube uh and it it, it doesn't look all that weird until you tell yourself these cats are asleep because they're just walking around doing cat stuff and you're like oh they're not awake they're asleep that's weird like 
But to me, that would seem to suggest that uh, when my cat dreams, maybe he's, um, you know, walking around hunting some birds or something, doing cat stuff. When my dog dreams, I, I get the sense that she's at the park, uh, perhaps barking at other dogs as she's fond of doing. Um, sometimes um, uh, she's even woken herself up. <laughs> Like she'll be like, and then wake up like, burr, burr, and what? Like all confused, like what was happening? Like, and that's really adorable. So uh, if you've ever seen a pet wake itself up from, from a dream or get woken up by the dream, it's hilarious. You need to keep your eyes out for it. Um, so yeah, lots of animals have REM sleep, but we can't really ask them. I think it's a pretty safe assumption that, um, mammals and birds that experience REM sleep or that or whose brains enter REM sleep probably have dreams what those dreams are like I don't know but I think they probably those the, those stages of sleep in those animals probably are accompanied by dreams um, there's one way there's one way that maybe we could get to the bottom of this that I was toying with last night but I would need a chimpanzee who could sign, right? Um, you guys know, like Coco the gorilla, um, Kanzi the chimpanzee. You know, uh, we've we've taught some of the great apes, the non-human great apes, to sign, uh, and we find that they can communicate. Um, they can they can learn to communicate as about, about as well as a as a young human child, right? So maybe we could ask them. Um, and, and to my knowledge, no one's done that, but um, I think it would be really cool. Um, usually the signing is a lot simpler when we're communicating with apes who, who've learned to sign. Um, um, so you'd have to sort of work out a vocabulary with them to talk about uh, dreams. Uh, which might be difficult to do but if you could do that then you could ask uh, a gorilla or a chimpanzee um you know what did you dream about uh and i think that would be really cool um so i think it's a safe assumption that uh some non-human animals dream um you might like andrea early have uh maybe you don't remember very many dreams um, maybe you recall so few dreams that you're not sure that you dream every night. Maybe you don't dream. Some people say, I never dream. Has anyone heard that or from a friend or uh, does anyone feel that way themselves? Like, oh man, I never have any dreams. A few, I see some nods, yeah. But the fact is you dream every night, multiple times. But because of what I mentioned before, um, you don't, uh, you have a lot of difficulty remembering dreams if you don't awaken directly from them. Um, so if you're awakened directly from a dream by an alarm clock going off, um, you'll probably remember that dream, uh, and maybe your alarm clock will even be incorporated into the dream. I've had this before when I had my old, uh, digital remember when alarm clocks weren't part of your cell phone like when they were actual separate i i had this old digital one from like the the 70s or something i think it was one of my parents old alarm clocks and i would use that and um it would start going off and it would get incorporated into my dream sometimes it would be incorporated like a countdown um like uh like i remember one dream where i was just a disembodied point watching a rocket take off and and there it was like a countdown and then the rocket took off and i woke up and i think what had happened was my and eh, the alarm going off was regular uh like a regular noise and made me made me dream of this countdown so uh or if you're in a sleep uh sleep lab i can wake you up i can see on the eeg oh so and so is in rem sleep right now uh, let's see what they're dreaming about. So I just gently wake them up. 
and uh, ask them what they were dreaming. And they might say, oh, I was having this wonderful dream where uh, I didn't have to be in the sleep lab or something. I don't know. Uh, so a lot of people don't remember their dreams because they just don't wake up at the right time. Um, Dahlia, go ahead. Just a random interesting thing that I, I thought of. Um, if it's if you're doing a like sleep deprived DEG for um, epilepsy, they actually don't want you to dream. Oh, really? So huh. yeah, but they want you to sleep. Huh. So huh. as soon as you start to go into a deep enough sleep to dream, um, they wake you up. Oh, that's and so annoying. they make you stay up all night, and then um, you like you go in and they set up the EEG, and they you, you fall asleep, and they wake you up like every fifteen minutes because you you're like too deep asleep. Oh, well, that sounds like a terrible night's sleep. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But of course, I suppose I suppose the rationale behind that is because um, uh, people with epilepsy can have abnormal brain waves, right? So that's why an EEG will be used to diagnose it. And um, I wonder if that's because it's easier to see those abnormal waves when you're when you're in non-REM sleep. I don't actually know much about this, but yeah, that, yeah that's interesting. I think the, the idea, it's easy to see the abnormal waves when you're in like a not, you're not normal state of being, which is why they have you do it sleep deprived. And it's the same reason they flash lights in your eyes and the same thing. Oh, um, right, right. Yeah. And then, and then of course, because with an EEG, you have multiple electrodes all over the scalp. So you can actually uh, localize where the uh, epilog, uh, epi a bit of that, what's that word? Epilogenetic uh, tissue is wherever in the brain. Um, very cool. Very fascinating. It's amazing that we figured out how to do all this stuff. Um, so, well, um, I haven't been in a sleep lab myself, just full disclosure. Uh, my partner has, though. Um, and it was fine. Oh, excuse me. I've got the hiccups. It was fine. Um, so why are dreams difficult to remember anyway? Um, well, this is, this is always puzzling for me, you know, like, because you think that dreams would be very memorable, regardless of when you woke up. Maybe you had the dream, spent 10 minutes kind of floating around in um, a light but dreamless sleep, and then you wake up. Why wouldn't you remember your dreams, especially when your dreams are so strange? Um, well, one explanation comes from Stephen LaBerge, who's like the guy. Uh, when it comes to um, the scientific study of lucid dreaming. He's a psychophysiologist, which means he studies the mind-body connection, you know, the mind-brain, the mind-body connection. And I think that his idea is probably adapted from anti revansuos threat response theory, which we're going to look at in a moment. But... Uh, Laber presents an example in one of his books where he says, you know, you could imagine a cat that lives next door to this vicious dog. Um, and the cat might have a dream that the dog runs away or something. And maybe the cat wakes up thinking that the dog actually ran away and carelessly ventures into the yard and uh, gets eaten by the dog. Uh, that's kind of a toy example. But I think what LaBerge is getting at is that um, we don't want to remember the absurd or uh, reality incongruent aspects of our dreams and mistake them for facts about how the world is. Now, um, in some ways, this strikes me as plausible. In other ways, it doesn't. Um, one way it seems to me to be plausible is because I've had this experience when I was young uh, where I have a dream and wake up and think it happened. I remember, actually, I wasn't even that young. I was probably about nine or 10. And I think I had this dream where my parents were going to make me go to this summer camp. And I woke up uh and my mom was up and about my sister was getting up and we were all waking up and uh and uh mom comes in gotta get ready for school 
and I'm I'm like, oh, I don't I don't want to go to summer camp. No, oh no, it's like, what are you talking about? I'm like you you're gonna you're gonna we're gonna go to summer camp. And my mom's like, oh, I think you dreamed that, you know. Um. So yeah, I've had that experience, but on the flip side, um, humans live in social groups, right? And we have for a long time, right? We're not like cats who are solitary animals. Even our distant ancestors going back millions and millions of years, you know, not even, you know, back to like Australopithecus, like uh, we would have probably been social creatures. So uh, even before language, we were social. Um, but uh, so I wake up, uh, maybe I'm... Um, uh, an early human ancestor or maybe i'm one of the extinct uh lineages of the human race like maybe i'm homo erectus or maybe i'm a neanderthal i wake up and i'm like oh uh i had a dream where uh something happened uh whoa you know someone else is going to do the same thing that my mom said to me and they're going to say i think you might have dreamed that you know like maybe caveman josh wakes up and he's like oh did you guys see the moon disappear last night? Like it got devoured by, uh, by, uh, I don't know, um, the great sea serpent of wherever, uh, they're going to say, Hey, I think you were dreaming. Um, look, the moon is still there anyway. Come on, let's go hunt and gather. Got to go get some hunting and gathering done. Right. So I don't know how plausible this is. It sounds on the surface, a little plausible but the more i think of it the more i doubt it um what are your thoughts i wonder mm, daniel says it could be easily turned on its head it seems to suggest it would be harmful harmful to remember false things but similarly it would be harmful to forget true things yes and also um we remember false things all the time right um oh man witness testimony after an event takes place even by changing like a certain word will yeah completely give it a completely different answer you yeah smash into the house or crash into the house yeah it's yeah. crazy even um even waking memories are subject to uh being changed simply by recollecting them right this is why we don't have uh the lineups anymore you know they line up all the suspects and the witness comes and says it was that guy we don't do that anymore because uh witnesses are actually very unreliable witness testimony is is unreliable so we we, we don't do that anymore or at least um uh, most places don't um so maybe we don't remember our dreams because it but could be maladaptive um we might risk uh, getting things wrong uh, about getting 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 things wrong, being mistaken about facts that would be critical to survival. But if you don't remember your dreams, there's no worries about that. The thing is, though, if you awaken directly from REM sleep, uh, you will remember your dream. And of course, obviously, dreams have been an inspiration for um lots of different things throughout the years uh they would have been uh, and i don't want to get ahead of myself here but they were certainly by many many cultures uh dreams have been and still are regarded as important they might be messages um most most cultures i would say think of dreams as messages or as actual beings um and these messages might be important um maybe we don't remember our dreams for the same reason we don't act out our dreams right it would be bad in some way but i mean you bore the line the distinction between reality and fiction if you have that going for you then welcome to the world of mental illness and schizoaffective disorders so. yeah exactly <laughs> and and that's the that's the interesting thing like i I don't know. I, I think I think the reason why we don't remember our dreams may actually just be a consequence of how it all works. And it may have to do with what dreaming is for. 
right? Um, and I, I don't mean that in like a teleological sense. I mean that in an evolutionary sense. Like, um, what is the what is the adaptive function of dreaming if there is one? If we identify that, that might tell us why they're hard to recall. Um, so we'll get to that. But why do we dream? Uh, well, we'll get to that too. Um, how have we understood dreams? Well, here's, here's where we see that the dreams are uh, associated with the supernatural and the paranormal, right? Um, a lot of ancient societies, uh, uh, many cultures across the globe regarded dreams as divine or supernatural. They were either messages from God, gods, spirits, or ancestors, or they were themselves uh, spirits or gods. The ancient Greeks um, believed in Morpheus, who was the, um, the supreme god of dreams. Morpheus means shaper of form. And Morpheus would send Oniroi. Oniroi are dreams. They preside over various aspects of dream. You'd have Oniroi for nightmares, or Oniroi for erotic dreams, Oniroi for divine inspiration. So there was a god of dreams, but also dreams themselves were sent by different gods who had specialties and different aspects of dreaming. Um, anyone excited for uh, anyone excited for Sandman on Netflix? I don't have Netflix. No. Oh no, <laughs> um, I am. Uh, Neil Gaiman. You guys know Neil Gaiman? Yeah, American Gods. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sandman is like his magnum opus. Um, is this supposed to be like the Sandman from like E.T.A. Hoffman Sandman? No, it's not. It's a different Sandman. It's um, this Sandman is um, an anthropomorphic personification of dreams. Oh, and, that's cool. Yeah. Uh, I think Gaiman has a lot of input. I think he's executive producing and looking at the trailer, the trailer is pretty, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic um, because at, like after Cowboy Bebop, uh, I was like, oh no, I don't know if we should adapt manga, anime, comic books anymore. Um, but um, yeah, I have yet to see like a live a live adaptation of any of the anime yet because I don't want to ruin it for myself. I'm just yeah. I just refuse to watch any. Yeah, I mean, I wanted it to be good, um, and I also kind of wanted it to get a second season to try and redeem itself. But uh, I don't know what I don't know what they were thinking. It's like okay, we're gonna make it from we're gonna make it uh, different from the anime but randomly stick in a bunch of exact shot for shot things from the anime that don't make sense now that we've tried to make it different from the anime. Ugh, you know, and I thought the cast did a good job. I thought the guy who played uh, uh, Jet was like a perfect live action Jet. You know, I was like, this guy's nailing it. It's just a problem that the, the show itself is not good. So, you know, uh, but, but Sandman looks good. So if you want to read about dreams uh in a comic in comic book form in like an epic nine or ten volume graphic novel series this it's so good like it's so good um <coughs> but enough about that um <clears throat> not just the greeks but many other cultures attributed uh this sort of importance to dreams um the um Aboriginal people of Australia, according to their folklore, the universe was dreamed into existence, for example. Uh, in the Old Testament, in the book of Daniel, uh, Daniel interprets the dreams of King Nebuchadnezzar II, the king of Babylon, right? So, uh, you know, again, uh, divine or prophetic importance. And even scientific breakthroughs have occurred due to um, inspiration from dreams. Uh, for example, Kekule had a dream of an Ouroboros, a snake that, that devours its own tail. And that, he claims, led him to the discovery of the structure of the benzene molecule, which is a sort of 
circular thing made up of a bunch of hexagonal uh, molecules. I'm not a chemist, so I'm not the best person to explain it, but the story is well known. Um, <clears throat> probably though, um, we don't really get to anything that we can start to call scientific. Uh, and even now we probably wouldn't treat this as scientific. Um, but we don't really get anything close to a modern account of dreams and dreaming until we get to Freud. And he has a psychoanalytic explanation of dreams, obviously, which you can read about in his book, The Interpretation of Dreams, which was published in 1899. Now, um, again, recall Freud is all, Freud is all about uh, uh, the conscious and the unconscious uh, the repressed and the surmounted returning to the conscious mind. Um, and Freud thought along these lines for dreams as well, for it's how he explained dreams, was uh, that they are actually a result of wish fulfillment. So maybe you have an unconscious wish and it's censored. So it conceals the fulfillment of the wish. This is why dreams contain such diverse imagery but uh, for Freud, most of that imagery is really uh, censoring um, some kind of sexual desire, which, yeah, that's like, obviously, this is Freud, right? So, um, <clears throat> so like, if I told, if I said to Freud, Freud, hey, I had a dream where I was... Um, exploring a cave what do we think freud would do with that uh i know i'm it's kind of inappropriate but i can allude a cave to in terms of holes but <laughs> yeah <laughs> um i yeah. would i would say you know i would i would say i would think freud would say <laughs> something. what's that <laughs> he said you, you make a your mom joke <laughs> yeah, he would. He would. He would. He would probably say something like, oh, you have an unconscious desire to return to the womb or something, you know, something weird. Um, uh, maybe I have it. If I have a dream that I'm having a. Um, what if I have a lightsaber duel? What would that be about? What would Freud say there? Can only imagine. <laughs> that imagery, yeah, just springs to mind. Yeah. Who knows? Maybe some kind of fight against his father. We talked about the Oedipus complex, and that was misinterpreted, though. The well, I was just I was just looking for for something that Freud would say is clearly a censored uh, male member, because oh. that happens all the time in dreams too, right? right. But yes, I I did put that down here. It is an interesting uh, fact that the idea of the Oedipus complex is is found in in the interpretation of dreams. Uh, and you need to interpret dreams to do psychoanalysis, because that's how you come to understand what it is that's sort of sitting under the surface in the subconscious. So, um, yeah, I guess like Jean-Francois said, uh, the Oedipus complex, maybe I have a dream where I'm having a duel with an older man, and then I go into a cave. And Freud is going to say, well, uh, clearly you have an unconscious desire to kill your father um, and return to the womb in some sense or another. Um, and he would say that yeah, the swords in your duel, well, those are obviously just penises. And the, the cave is, represents some kind of womb imagery. Ah, very good. I've solved it. So that's Freud. Um, uh, Freud, uh, does anyone know that famous line from Freud? Um, he's explaining uh, all kinds of sexual imagery and dreams. And, uh, you know, you got you to gotta remember, Freud's a guy who always had a cigar in his mouth. And uh, so, so, so someone says, what about you, Freud? You smoke a lot of cigars. Uh, Freud says, sometimes a cigar is just a cigar, sir. So... But that's why we can't really treat this as scientific. Like, uh, okay, I had this imagery in my dream. Is that a symbol for something? Or is it just what it is? You know? Maybe I'm just um, a nerdy guy who has a sword collection. So I dream about sword fighting. 
you know. But then Freud would say, why do you have a sword collection? Hmm? So, right, you know. Um, but anyway, this is this is sort of like, I guess, one of the first like modern accounts to try and systematically explain dreams. So I guess what you could say about Freud is that he has this idea that that dreams are almost like letters to yourself from your unconscious that have been censored um you know uh because that's just how it is um but dreams probably aren't letters to ourselves from our unconscious mind just as they may may in fact not be messages from any sort of divine or supernatural source to, to, to go completely in the other direction, Owen Flanagan thinks that, quote, dreams are evolutionary epiphenomena. That is, they play no causal role in the mental. Flanagan continues, dreaming came along as a free rider on a system designed to think and to sleep. So first of all, what is an epiphenomenon? Anybody familiar with that term? So an epiphenomenon is something that uh, doesn't have a causal role in the system of which it is, it is a part. Uh, a good example would be Huxley's example. I think all uh, T.H. Huxley, Darwin's bulldog, used the example of the whistle on a steam engine. So imagine an old steam engine, an old locomotive. The steam drives the engine. The steam also makes the whistle blow on the train. But the whistle doesn't affect the engine. It's just a thing. So it doesn't play a causal role in the mental. Um, epiphenomenon uh, or epiphenomena in consciousness studies, at least, are, are usually talked about like this. We might say like um, Jaguan Kim, for example, a philosopher of mind, argued famously that uh, conscious experience is an epiphenomenon. So I have this experience, like I'm thirsty. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm really thirsty. I'm gonna decide to have a drink. Okay, oh, there's a drink. I've got a can of Coke Zero right here. Mm, yum. So I did that, right? It seems like I did because of my experience. But as we've talked about in previous classes, um, like with Benjamin Liebe's experiments with um, voluntary movement, uh, the brain is already getting ready to reach out and pick this up before I think, like before I will that I reach out and pick it up. So if that's the case, that my motor cortex already kicks into gear before I have this, hmm, I'm gonna take a sip of Coke Zero, well, uh, then that means that my conscious intention to pick up the can and take a sip is an epiphenomenon. It didn't actually cause me to do that. So dreams might be an epiphenomenon. I personally don't like this term in this setting because, I mean, epiphenomenon is more of a philosophy term in evolutionary uh studies we talk about spandrels yeah I, I agree with it i i agree with that daniel yeah um and that's also why i don't like the the term epiphenomenon here um so like for example i can have a dream if i have an anxiety dream i i, I often find that that impacts my mood that day kind of starts me off, you know, I, I've gotten out of the wrong side of bed if I've had an anxiety dream, right? Um, same with nightmares. Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't think that even, even if, um, yeah, I, I don't think this is a right, this is the right word. Um, uh, I think the word that I would use would be spandrel. Um, spandrel, it, it, it's a term from Stephen Jay Gould. <laughs> yeah, 
you could do that though. You could have a lucid dream and, and then go find yourself and talk to yourself. That'd be cool. So, um, uh, a spandrel is, is a term that, um, uh, Stephen Jay Gould introduced, um, a spandrel is this, it's something that, uh, didn't necessarily involve, uh, did, didn't evolve, uh, because it was a function that increased fitness, but it came along as a consequence of other things that evolved for a purpose. Right. So, um, so in this case, uh, you know, like all of you were saying, you know, dreams do seem to play a causal role in the mental dreams have no function, but they can have effects. That's not an epiphenomenon. That's a spandrel, you know? Um, so I, I, I guess I kind of agree with Flanagan, but I don't agree with his, um, terminology. His terminology could be a little bit more precise here. Hobson thinks dreams are epiphenomena in the same sense that Hobbes, um, that um, Flanagan does. After all, a lot of people don't remember their dreams, and they're fine. Not having a function. Well, uh, in, in, in an evolutionary context, a function... Um, well, a function in, in an evolutionary context um, is usually that it increases fitness. That's the overall, if, if it does that, then that's what it's for. Um, so dreams may not increase fitness. And what I mean by fitness is not, you know, a, a common misunderstanding about evolution um, and that, that, that phrase, survival of the fittest, that doesn't mean survival of the biggest, the strongest, and the fastest. Like, that's not what it means. It means um fitness means how many um progeny do you have so either how many descendants or how many copies of your genes are there does something increase the uh, the copies of your genes in the gene pool if it does it's increasing fitness so dreams might not do that um so they didn't really evolve to do anything, but they just sort of happen as a consequence of the kinds of brains that we have evolved, which are brains that allow us to reason about the world, to remember things, to learn, to imagine, uh, that kind of thing. So that's what a function is. A function increases fitness. So why do we have opposable thumbs? Well, uh, opposable thumbs must have been selected for because they allowed us to manipulate objects uh, better than creatures that don't have opposable thumbs, right? Uh, have you ever seen a, a bear try and manipulate objects? They just kind of have these big paws that they can't really do a lot with. But if you're a panda bear, you have a kind of opposable thumb and you can grab your bamboo and just munch on it, right? So it increases fitness. Um, that's the sense in, in which uh, dreams may not have a function uh, in an evolutionary context. And the reason why uh, Gould uses the term spandrel, this actually comes from architecture. You know, a spandrel is like a, a thing that goes across uh, like an arch that looks nice, but it doesn't do anything to support the structure. It just looks cool. Um, so that's why I prefer spandrel here, not epiphenomena uh, or epiphenomenon, because that implies that dreams don't have a causal role in the mental when they clearly do. We remember uh, a nightmare uh, that will affect your mood. If you have a great dream, that'll affect your mood, you know? Um, you know, sometimes you dream about like an old adversary or, or like a crush or a dead relative. And depending on who you've dreamt about, it will impact your mood for, uh, potentially a very long time. Right. So they can certainly have effects and because they have effects, I'm really more comfortable with the term spandrel rather than epiphenomena. Uh, but anyway. 
let's get back to Revon Suo. Anti Revon Suo has his threat simulation theory or threat response theory. And that theory says that dreams do have a function. Dreams um, or our brains evolved in, to be able to dream in order to simulate threat, uh, threats and to practice dealing with those threats. As evidence for this, he points out the fact that in modern dream reports, uh, we find a lot more threatening events than we usually face in waking life. And um, uh, there's other lines of evidence uh, that I don't mention on the slide, but that Blackmore mentions. Um, uh, children dream of a lot of threatening situations, for example. Um, adult men tend to have more dreams featuring aggression with other men. Although I that that I I don't notice that myself. I don't I don't have very many violent dreams. I have weird dreams where I'll like get lost or something. So yeah, I don't know. But um, so maybe that's one reason is that um, dreams evolved uh, as a sort of simulation uh, for dealing with novel threats. Or maybe dreaming is a, a kind of play. This is an idea that Humphrey endorses, a kind of play of the mind. Um, and play is, you know, it's not just, it's not all fun and games, really. Playing is how pretty much all animals learn, right? Um, uh, again, if you have a pet, right? If you think of your, your kitten or your puppy and they're playing, the play behavior is what they need to master in order to get along with other creatures, to catch prey, um, that kind of thing, right? And we're no different. Humans are no different in that respect. So Humphrey writes that dreaming represents the most audacious and ingenious of nature's tricks for educating her psychologists, us. Um, dreaming may help us uh, by serving as a sort of simulation or play uh, learn how to deal with all kinds of things. Hobson thinks dreams have a different purpose. He thinks that dreams support memory consolidation. So um, maybe dreams aren't for simulating or play, or mental play, but um, they're like a sort of um, disk defrag. You know, when you defragment your hard drive on your computer, Maybe that's your brain's version of this, clearing out the memory traces that it's not going to need and reinforcing those that are important. Some think that um, maybe what's going on here is that the, um, these uh, neural connections are being randomly flooded uh, to try and disconnect um, superfluous or unnecessary connections. And that may, might be why dreams are so random. Uh, so that's another interesting idea. There's a big box in uh, this chapter of Blackmore that, that gives all of these theories in more detail. It's like goes over like two pages. I would check that out for sure. Ooh. So dreams could be for any number of things. And we don't need to remember our dreams for any of this to work. There's a typo for any of this to be work. Uh, we don't need to remember our dreams for this to work. Our uh, dreams might be some kind of brain hard drive defragmenting memory consolidation things. We don't actually have to remember our dreams for that to be the case. We don't have to remember consciously dreaming as play or as threat simulation because uh, knowledge how to do something is not the same as uh, episodic memory. Like you can have episodic memory. If I remember what happened during my dream, that's episodic memory. But if I'm remembering a skill and implementing that skill, that's procedural memory. And that doesn't have to be tied to any conscious episode. Um, we know this from the case of HM. Does anyone know the case of HM? Is that the railroad guy with the spike? That's Phineas Gage. Oh my God. Yeah, HM stands for Henry Molison. And he had his hippocampus removed uh, to treat epilepsy. And he wasn't able to form new uh, episodic memories. Uh, 
But what he was able to do was acquire more procedural and spatial memories. So uh, they taught him how to do a bunch of things. Yeah, the Memento guy. Yeah, uh, that move Christopher Nolan's movie Memento, which actually is pretty accurate when it comes to brain stuff. It was based on, uh, I think, H.M. and um, Clive Weiring, uh, who has a um, who had um, herpes encephalitis, which destroyed his long term memory. Uh, so these guys uh, like H.M. learned to do that Tower of Hanoi puzzle and he learned to do the, the backwards mirror tracing task. Uh, he was able to reproduce the floor plan of his house. But he didn't have conscious memories of ever learning to do any of these things. Uh, Clive Weiring was a composer and a pianist who could still play the piano, but had no memory of learning the piano or who any of his friends or family were. Right. It's so the same thing here. I might not remember that in my I had a crazy dream where I fought a dragon or something, but maybe my mad skills at sword play will come in handy if I ever have to defeat some kind of adversary um, out there in the, in the real world, right? And there's actually a lot of, uh, a lot of interest in this in the 80s uh, in using lucid dreams to rehearse things. Um, some self-taught lucid dreamers uh, who wrote to Stephen LaBerge and he reproduces some of their letters in his book, Exploring the World of Lucid Dreaming. Uh, talk about how they rehearse things. There's one I remember of a manager at a store who would um, plan out the layouts and the merchandising in a dream because she could just go like, move this here. And then the shelf would be over there. And it was like virtual reality. And you could just move everything around and see how it looked and go to work. And okay, guys, we're going to do it this way. Figured it out while I was sleeping uh athletes um some athletes practice uh if they have lucid dreams they can practice stuff and the skills um you know again because because if i'm you know shooting a basketball or something my motor cortex is doing the exact same thing it's doing as when i'm shooting a basketball in real life so those connections are still getting better um so, yeah, I, I think that's a really interesting thing. Um, we can practice all kinds of things, potentially. Uh, if you're nervous uh, and you've got a big speech or a big engagement coming up, you could practice that, you know? And I think that this prospect uh, might have been a little overblown in LaBerge's book. Uh, you know, he, he has a whole chapter on how, like, oh, you could just, like, get better at everything by doing it, doing it while you're asleep in a lucid dream. Uh, but not everybody can be that good at lucid dreaming, right? Even when you realize you're dreaming, sometimes something happens and a minute later you forget, right? I've had that happen before where I'm like, oh, this is a dream, wow, everything looks so real. Hey, look at that funny bird over there. And then I, I forget, you know, so. But how do dreams work? How do we put them together? Let's talk about that now. Mm, well, um, kind of. I mean, daydreaming, if you mean visu visualization in terms of daydreaming, that's not quite the same. Right, but we have like, in sports and performance type, we have a class where we see like athletes, like they'd be just out there, you know, on the ice or on the field, and they would just be like staring blankly while their body's kind of twitching with what they see in front of them. I would and say, I guess, yeah, okay, yeah, so I would say, I would say that the aim is very much the same. Um, visualizing, strengthening the mind muscle connection, as it were, right? Um, and I, I, I've, I've seen some athletes do that where they're not visualized. Like I've seen like um, strength athletes, for example, well, they're, they'll do the movement, but with very little weight just to, and they'll do it really slow just to like get the movement so that when they do lift something heavy, they're not going to do it wrong and like move one centimeter the wrong way and drop everything. Right. So yeah, I would say that 
this is very much the same kind of thing. Um, and there's a lot of sports psychology in that chapter. I think you might be able to get this book at the library. Um, so if anyone wants to check it out, it's good. There's a little bit of bunk in it, but um, mostly it's pretty okay. Um, so how do we put, uh, how do we, how do we figure out what dreams are, are all about? How does it work? Well, LeBerge puts forward an interesting idea. So the brain, remember, is nearly as active during REM sleep as when you're awake. Um, some areas are less active, yes, but overall the activity levels are quite similar. And that's probably because the dreaming brain is doing the same thing the waking brain is doing, more or less. It's representing your body in an environment. Now, where, where does the brain get what it needs to do to do this? Um, now, uh, first of all, what I'm about to tell you is probably a gross oversimplification. And there are some people who disagree with it, right? There are like the inactivists who would say that what I'm about to tell you is wrong. And I've even started to question it recently, um, thanks to some neuroscience stuff that I was doing. I taught a neuroscience class and I thought to myself, I'm, I'm rethinking how I think the mind works. This is really cool. But anyway, the brain is really active. What is the brain doing when we're awake and consciously aware? Like, like right now, what's your brain doing? Processing stimuli. Yeah. Yeah, it's processing stimuli, but, but what's all this? Right? Is this, is this the can of Coke Zero that I'm seeing right now? Or, or is there no spoon? right? This, this is, we talk about like, oh, this is an object out there in the world. Look at that. That's a can of Coke Zero. That's a real thing that exists in the world, mind independently. Hang on. Is it though? Or is this my representation of a... Based off all your senses, it is indeed a can of Coke Zero. Yeah, there's something out there that is a can of Coke Zero, but what I'm actually seeing and touching is all created in my brain. Right. Right? It's kind of mm -hmm. like, uh, what do they call this? Indirect realism, right? There's, there's, there's naive realism, which... Uh... <laughs> yeah, good point. Or maybe we inhabit a shared world and, uh, and I've solved the problem of other minds. Um, I don't know. Uh, so look, I got my, uh, this here, this is a mental representation. Uh, on, on direct realism or naive realism, that's the theory that there's a, an external world and it exists and I am in direct contact with it. So if I say like, oh, this is, this is the thing in itself right here, this is, the can of Coke Zero. That's what a direct realist would say. But of course, that can't be the case. I've, I've spoken to people who, who claim to be direct realists, and I'm just like, but how? Um, I, uh, anyway, why do I say that? Because of the brain. The brain is representing this. My brain is representing this. Dan's brain is representing the image that he sees. Everyone else is representing this can. This is a mental representation of the can. It's not the can itself. In fact, I'm a bit of a Kantian when it comes to this stuff. I don't think that I can know anything in itself. Because you, you can't know things in themselves. You can only know the phenomenal aspects of them because you need a mind to know things. And the mind necessarily imposes structure on what's going into the mind to make it make sense so that's indirect um well well if you're a kantian it's transcendental idealism but for me let's just stick to indirect realism where this is just a mental representation of the can not the can itself i can't know the can itself because i can only know things via my mind so when i'm awake the brain is doing what it's constructing a representation of me 
my body, the external world, my, my cat, right? So, so like my brain's doing that. Great. Did I just, oh, okay, good. I'm still plugged in. So, uh, you know, I'm waking, I'm awake, I'm having a conscious experience. All of that uh, is coming from the external world. You know, light reflects off of objects, hits my retina, it's transduced, it goes to my visual cortex, and a bunch of other stuff happens, and eventually I have a visual experience. Same with all our other sense modalities. Same with introspection and imagination and all of that. So when we're awake, the brain is getting information from the outside world to generate an experience. It's as if the brain is a bit like a virtual reality uh, generator, but uh, the brain is its own audience. It's not like there's a little guy in your head who's watching it all on a, on a theater of the mind, right? That would be the homunculus fallacy. So, uh, so it's like the brain, the brain is its own audience is how I like to put it. So, but when we're asleep, there's much less coming in from the external world, right? Um, you can have a dream and stuff could be happening, uh, but likely uh, that dream is being constructed from internal information, not external information, unless something important happens, like a really loud noise could wake you up right? You know, if there was danger, a loud noise might signal danger, which is why loud noises wake you up. Um, imagine if you slept through a dangerous situation. Uh, well, maybe some of us would like to be able to do that. I don't know. Um, People sleep through fires all the time. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But fires yeah. aren't loud until they get really bad, right? Uh, but But if there's a sudden noise like if I hear a window smash, then, then I'll be like, oh, I'm about to be burgled, you know? And then I reach for my, uh, my nerdy sword collection or something. I don't know. Uh, I actually don't have a nerdy sword collection, but I'd like one. Uh, you have some guitars. What's that? You have some guitars. Yeah. yeah. Well, I can't hit anybody with that. That's too nice. <laughs> oh, you know what I do have? I have this really great cast iron frying pan, which is awesome for cooking and for home defense. I don't advocate violence, but like, you know, all those Americans who are like, I need a gun because freedom. And I'm like, but just have like good cooking utensils, like, like Samwise from Lord of the Rings, right? Like he was like slaying orcs with his frying pan. Like, so uh, yeah, that's fine. Anyway, to get back on track, um, so if you're dreaming, where's the information or not information, but just what stuff is the brain going to use to generate an experience, if not from the outside world? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, we can. Actually, let's break now. Let's break now and then come back to this. Um, so let's come back at like, I don't know, like 10 minutes after four. Okay, perfect. Okay, I'll, I'll see you all in uh, a few minutes. I'll answer Daniel's question in the interim. So go ahead, Daniel. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. That's tricky. Um, is the mind a thing in itself? Hmm. You know, I've never thought about that before. That's a really good question. I, I have to admit, I'm actually not sure how to answer that. Um, 
you know what? Let me look over my copy of uh, the critique um, while I'm on break and maybe I can find something. Sophie's, uh, yeah, I don't know, uh, that I don't know Sophie's world, but, um, I'll, I'll let, I'll, I'll let me get back to you on this one. Cause now I'm curious. Uh, but yeah, here, I'm going to, uh, I also am going to step away to the to the break room. How do I come on escape? Oh, I need to stop. Okay, stop sharing my screen and then I can pause recording. Okay, I'll be back. Okay, just getting ready to get going again in a in a moment. About one more minute. Let's share the old screen. Let's see who's back. Okay, good. Okay, so um, just real quick, um, I just thought I'd go over to the old bookshelf and grab these. Uh, these are LaBerge's books, if you're interested. Um, this is his first book. It's just called Lucid Dreaming, uh, based largely on his PhD thesis, if I'm not mistaken, uh, which he did at Stanford University, um, which we'll talk about momentarily, but it was one of the experiments that or a series of experiments that established that lucid dreaming is a thing. Uh, it's not um, anything supernatural or paranormal. It is a thing that we can investigate scientifically. It actually happens and we can study it with empirical tools. This is his follow-up. And this thing is the book that I read when I was younger. It's by Leberge and a guy named Howard Rheingold. Um, you know, again, there's a little bit of bunk. Um, there's some talk of the possibilities of dream telepathy and, and, um, and that kind of thing, right? But there's also a lot of good stuff. Um, so uh, this is actually my second copy. Uh, the first copy uh, throughout my teenage years, I read uh, until it fell apart. So uh, to this day, I still remember a lot of the contents of that book. It's weird how, how that works, eh? You, you get obsessed with something when you're young and it sticks with you. So, um, and I practiced having lucid dreams from, I don't know, probably like the age of 12 through to the end of high school. And I was okay at it. I'd have like one every couple of months. And then I stopped. Um, just because life got in the way. Um, you know, I used to be better at sleeping in. And then all of a sudden, I'm getting up working early shifts at work and that kind of thing. So I didn't really have time to do it. So I just kind of let it go. And uh, but now, for some reason, I guess just with time, um, if I'm sleeping in, and I get up and I make the conscious effort to have one, I can usually have one. Um, uh, but not always. So not only um, did LaBerge help to establish the reality of this interesting phenomenon, uh, but he also set out ways that you could actually practice it and get better at it, right? Which I think is neat. So, so um, that's cool. Also, Daniel had a question about Kant, um, which I uh, try, I've tried to answer. I flip through um the index of my copy of the critique actually is this is interesting uh nowhere in the index is the word mind mentioned so interesting but um daniel asked if um if if the mind is a thing in, in itself um and really i this is a tricky thing to answer because for kant a thing in itself is just something that we can't no, except by how it affects, except by its appearances. And I guess the mind could be like that. Um, 
it depends whose mind, my mind or your mind. Your mind is certainly a thing in itself to me because I can only know it indirectly. Uh, but my mind might also be like that because I also can't really, I don't have direct access to all the workings of my own mind either. So that's a difficult question to answer. Um, uh, for now, I, I guess I'm tempted to say that the mind isn't really one or the other, the way Kant is talking about it. The mind is a thing that allows us to know things. And it's the things that we want to know that are things in, the, in themselves, that are noumenal things that we know because of the appearances, because of the phenomena that they cause in our minds. Uh, or the, the mind also causes, because the mind structures experience, right? We've got forms of sensible intuition, like space and time. We've got categories of understanding, right? So, but I am not the guy to ask this question to. Um, uh, Kant is uh, difficult, and I, I just haven't put enough time in to confidently answer this question. These are just kind of what I was thinking over the break. Uh, and I also Googled Sophie's World. Looks cool. I'm going to have to watch it. I've never seen it, but looks like a pretty cool movie. So yeah, I'll check it out. Um, so we were talking about how the brain constructs our experiences when we're awake. When we're awake, we have an external world and that world is stable. Uh, and so our, uh, our representation of the world is stable as well. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I saw that as well. I'm uh, probably going to watch the movie first, but uh, the book would probably be good too. Um, so uh, if we're not getting it from an external source, if you know, perceptual experience like right now, we could say that my conscious experience is online, meaning that I'm uh, connected to the world, for lack of a better term. But dreams are offline because we don't have very much information coming in through the senses. So the the, whatever uh, the brain is drawing on to produce dreams must be internal rather than external. So um, Leberge actually proposes that the brain is drawing upon memories, emotions, expectations, motivations, different mental states, and the contents of those states that are already in there to generate experiences during sleep. So I don't know, uh, what's an example? Maybe something happened to me yesterday. Um, uh, what did I dream about actually? Uh, maybe I can try and connect this to, to uh... okay, so I had a strange dream recently. This is a real dream, it really happened. <laughs> oh. Sorry, that was my dog. <laughs> She must have heard a noise. Um, Tula, come here. Oi, Tula. Come here. Tula. Come here, Tula. I better go get her. Yeah, right now. Yes. God. Oh my God. <sighs> Neighbors. So I'm getting ready to move, right? Um, thank goodness. Um, so we're looking for an apartment, you know, my partner and I. We're going around, we're looking, we're stressing. So I have this dream a few nights ago uh, where I'm moving, uh, but it's in my weird dream house. I have this dream house that's always different, but it's always my house. And sometimes it always have these, these big crazy rooms and, but it's always my house. It's hard to explain. It's like, it, that's my house in my dream. So I'm in my dream house 
And I go into another room and there's all these aquariums set up. Um, and I, I, for some reason, another thing that happens in my dreams, especially like anxiety dreams is uh, I always dream about weird fish lurking under the water. Like I'll be like near a lake and I'll see like this gigantic fish swimming and I'm like, Ugh, I'm not gonna go in there. Um, so there's all these weird fish uh, and I'm, I'm just like, ah, oh, how am I going to move all of these? I forgot about all these aquariums. How am I going to move them all? And what am I going to do with these weird fish? Um, so like, I, I must have gone to bed uh, uh, thinking about this upcoming move. Like, oh, I got to find a place. We got to arrange the move and it's stressing me out. So it makes us way into my dream, right? Freud called this day residue, right? The, the stuff from the day before that seems to influence your dreams. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know, like, what's with the weird stuff under the water? I think it's just because the water is like, what's under there? We don't know. It's mysterious and dark. And it's like the subconscious, uh, you know, it's like going into a basement or an attic or a cave. It's one of those scary places. So, uh, so I got this day residue and that activates other concepts, you know, maybe that's why the fish were there because, um, usually when I'm anxious, I find I dream about big weird fish. Yeah. Sea monsters, right? That's what those are all about. That's like what Jean-Francois was saying, uh, a few weeks ago. I remember as well, like just anything with the ocean, man. So and that's the weird thing is usually it's never the ocean. It's always a lake or a river or a pond it, for me. It's never the ocean, uh, which is, I don't know. So what's going on here? Well, you've got certain things active in your mind when you go to sleep. And those are probably reactivated when you enter REM sleep. And that's probably what your brain builds a dream out of is what, what Laberge calls schemas or what philosophers and cognitive scientists would call concepts. Concepts are like ideas, they're mental items. Usually, uh, concept is the number one word students use wrong in their essays. They'll say like, I'm gonna write about the concept of ESP. No, you're not, you're writing about the phenomenon of ESP. The concept of ESP is my understanding, what is ESP, right? That's a concept. And we have concepts for everything. And these concepts get activated. Remember, associative memory, neurons that fire together, wire together. Uh, so dreams are very much these absurd sort of stream of consciousness like experiences that the brain generates using internal representations rather than representations caused by what's going on in the external world. And this could explain why dreams are so weird. Why are they so unpredictable and unstable? When we're awake, our representation of the external world is stable because, and this is a controversial take for some philosophers, the external world exists. It's out there and it is what it is. And it's not, you know, it, 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 it's stable. It changes, but it, it changes according to like the laws of nature, right? The changes are regular. But when we're dreaming, there is nothing stable to build these representations out of, to build these experience out of. The prefrontal cortex, you know, while the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is active during dreaming, it is a little bit less active than when we're awake. And other areas of the frontal cortex are also less active. So we have this stream of conscious experience kind of being built from internal representations like memories, emotions, um, motivations, expectations. Um, and we don't notice how weird it is because we're also uh, not the best reasoners when we're dreaming. Uh, and this will actually become important when it comes to working out how you can tell that you're dreaming, which I will tell you how to do in case you're curious. There's a lot of different theories of dreaming. And one that I wanna talk about very briefly is Daniel Dennett's cassette theory. Because this is very interesting to me. Dennett is using this, as he often does, 
with with a lot of the, the theories and, and things he comes up with a, as a sort of intuition pump, right? As a thought experiment. So for those who don't know, Daniel Dennett is a philosopher of mind, probably one of the most influential philosophers of mind of, of the late 20th and early 21st century. Um, also a big member of the skeptical community. Um, and uh, just seems like a cool dude. Um, so he's got a cassette theory of dreaming, which says that dreams are not experiences. And this is actually inspired by some early dream, early 20th century dream research uh, on the part of a philosopher named Malcolm, I'm not, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it's argued, uh, it was argued early on that dreams cannot be experiences. Experiences are conscious, right? Like right now I'm having an experience and I'm conscious of it. But uh, when I'm asleep, I'm unconscious. So dreams can't be experiences. There was even one idea that dreams are spontaneously assembled upon awakening. So um, during REM sleep, uh, you're not actually having an experience, but your brain is putting together a narrative uh, that's just popped together when you wake up. And Dennett it, it was inspired by this. And in his book, Brainstorms, he has a paper called Our Dreams Experiences, where he argues that dreams could be the result of instantaneous memory insertions occurring at the moment of awakening. So what happens uh, on Dennett's theory? Well, what happens is um, two processes. One is a composition process, and it develops a dream narrative during sleep. Uh, in fact, according to, to some versions of this theory, it could be, um, I don't know this, last Thursdayism, um, but, um, but um, um, the, uh, the, so there's, there's several uh, narratives that are composed, and, and one of them is popped in uh, when you awake, like a cassette tape into a tape player. It's already got everything on it but you just popped it in and pushed play. Uh, so um, what we remember as an experience is really inserted into memory like a cassette tape into a cassette player. So for Dennett, there's nothing that it's like to dream because your dream isn't an experience. But there is something that it's like to have had a dream because once you remember the dream, it's like you had this experience which according to Dennett never actually happened it was just popped in um which is curious a critique of creationism oh <laughs> well hey didn't that guy there was that monk who counted up all of the genealogies in the old testament and 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 based on at the length of everybody's lives he estimated that the earth was was created on a thursday morning like 5,000 years ago, 6,000 years ago. I forget the name of the guy, but there was some, some monk or priest, some, some Christian scholar who did that. Um, needless to say, we know the earth is a lot older than that. Uh, so anyway, um, that's interesting. But yeah, um, this is like, well, Blackmore says at any rate that this, that this is the, if this is the case, it's a difference that doesn't make a difference. And I find it incredibly weird that she says that because then she goes on to talk about lucid dreaming, which kind of poses a problem for this. Now, Dennett's, Dennett's whole thing is, I don't think he's actually trying to argue that dreams aren't put together in real time here. I don't really think that's the purpose of, of this. I think what the whole cassette theory is supposed to do is show you how it's possible, how you could think you've had an experience even though there's no experience in, there's nothing on the mental screen and the theater of the mind and the Cartesian theater, as it were, for a, an ego, for a subject, right? I think that's what he's trying to do. A big part of Dennett's entire project is to try and dispel problems with Cartesian philosophy. How did Gilbert Ryle describe Rene Descartes' substance dualism. Does anybody remember? Gilbert Ryle. He mentioned something about a ghost. Uh, 
I'll refresh your memory. Oh, Alexis. Okay, well, that's what, at this point, I really want to hear what you were going to say, but was he the one who said that there's no ghost in the machine? Yes, yes, exactly. He called Cartesian dualism the dogma of the ghost in the machine. Uh, Gilbert Ryle was Daniel Dennett's PhD supervisor. So Dennett has done something very similar throughout his career, tried to dispel the problematic ways of thinking that Cartesian philosophy has sort of left us with. And one of these is that there's a place in the brain where it all comes together where there is a self, you know, watching this conscious experience on a screen. But that can't be the case, because then you have the homunculus problem, right? Like if I have a little person in my brain, like imagine consciousness works as if uh, your consciousness is the pilot of a, of, a, of a giant robot, right? People have that idea, like, like, uh, I, I, like maybe it's like Gundam or Evangelion or something, right? That's my body is the mecha and the pilot is the mind. But it can't be that way because how does that little guy, how does, how does he work? Does he have a little guy in his head? And it's just little guys all the way down. And that's called the homunculus problem. And it's a problem because it gives us an infinite regress. So Dennett's trying to say like, look, your dreams aren't, something happening to you on a theater of mind that you, your ego, yourself are watching. Um, I think his cassette theory of dreaming is actually meant to show how you can think you've had that kind of experience, even though you haven't. I don't think he actually believes that this is how dreams work. Um, at least I hope not, because there's a problem with it. And we'll get, th we'll get to that in a moment. But first, what does everyone else think of this cassette theory? Does it strike anyone as a little, is it really a difference that makes no difference? Like Blackmore says, it's a difference that makes no difference, whether dreams or experiences or whether they're spontaneous memory insertions. Is there really a difference that makes no difference? as a thinker. We'll tell you what, we'll come back to this after we talk about lucid dreams. How about that? So a lucid dream, as I've already mentioned, is a dream during which you know that you're dreaming. Um, they've been recorded since antiquity, but the term was coined in the early 20th century, I believe, by a Dutch psychotherapist named Frederick Van Eden, and the name stuck. But as I mentioned, a lot of uh, scientists thought it was impossible uh, because of the philosophical reasoning uh, that was prevalent in the recent uh, past. And that was that uh, when we are asleep, we are unconscious. How can you be conscious when you're unconscious? Uh, that was, that's what a lucid dream would amount to. You would arguably conscious, you'd be conscious if you were lucid in a dream. But how can that happen if you're unconscious and asleep? seems like a contradiction and therefore an impossibility. This is why lucid dreaming remained the province of parapsychologists for a long time. Serious scientists and philosophers were not even interested, not, in, not just in lucid dreams, but in dreams in general. Like what's, what's the point? This is superstitious mumbo jumbo. We don't need to worry about dreams. But lucid dreams were shown to be real independently by Keith Hearn and Stephen LaBerge, respectively. Keith Hearn was working at the University of Hull in the United Kingdom, and he uh, uh, conducted his experiments with uh, Alan Worsley, who was the person who was able to have lucid dreams very easily um, in 1979. Uh, LaBerge was a bit later in um, 1980 at Stanford, uh, but they each used these oneironauts as LaBerge calls them. These are explorers of the dream world. So it's like astronaut, you know, explorer of the stars. Well, oneironaut, explorers of the dreams. So um, uh, Keith Hearn used Alan Worsley, uh, a skilled lucid dreamer. LaBerge used other participants and himself. Um, he in fact developed a number of techniques that could be used to try and induce lucid dreams in a sleep lab. And this is very cool that this happened around the same time 
uh, it's like uh, calculus, you know, uh, Leibniz and Newton co-discovered calculus. Um, Darwin and uh, Alfred Russell Wallace co-discovered evolution by natural selection. Here's another one where we have two people coming upon the same thing at about the same time, uh, which is pretty cool when that happens. And, and I should mention that while LaBerge was a psychophysiologist, Keith Hearn uh, was a parapsychologist. Uh, he straight up parapsychology lab was where he was doing this work. Um, but once, once, you know, again, once this became established, it kind of ceased to be parapsychology, right? So um, LaBerge and, and Hearn each knew that the eye movements that dreamers make follows the, uh, oh, excuse me, follows the gazes that they're actually making in the dream. This is actually discovered by chance. Uh, a subject had been... Um, brought into the sleep lab and um, was wearing uh, a bunch of devices, including uh, an electro-oculogram, which measures eye movement from the muscle activity around your eyes. And there was a long period in REM sleep where the eye movements stopped looking random and became regular back and forth uh, movements like so. And they awoke the person to ask what they were dreaming about. And they said that they had been watching a game of table tennis in the dream and they were watching the ball going back and forth. So this was a dream report that was out in the literature and LaBerge and Hearn knew that uh, what they could do was arrange for their oneironauts, their experimental participants to make non-random eye movements at predetermined times from within a dream. So they could do something like, uh, you know, fall asleep in the sleep lab, they enter REM sleep. If they realize they're in a dream, they give a signal, a certain signal to, that, that, that wouldn't be random, you know, maybe like, you know, one, two, three, four, five, or something. Then they have to do the experiment. Um, maybe they have to do squats, or another big one is estimating time. That was another early thing that uh, dream, uh, dream researchers did with lucid dreamers is they wanted to know how long time, uh, like how, how, what was with the passage of time in dreams. And they found that it's quite close to the subjective passage of time in waking life. So when participants are uh, counting to 10 in waking life, it takes them about as long, you know, 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, takes them about as long to do that when they're awake as when they're in a dream. If they're estimating 10 seconds without counting, again, about the same length of time during waking life versus when you're in a lucid dream. So this was really cool because j just think, just think about what this is. Like, this is a means of communicating from within a dream. Like, just think about that for a second. Like, that's nuts. I mean, that's so cool. I mean, sure, we can communicate when we're in other altered states, right? Maybe not a flow state. In a flow state, you're you're in the flow, you're like, shut up. Like I'm trying to make breakfast. Like, um, but if you're in an unaltered state, like uh, sensory deprivation or, or, or a psychedelic trip or meditating, you can, you can make a self report. But the difference is here is you're asleep. You can make a communication to the world when you're offline from the world. And I just think that's like the coolest thing. You know, that's just so far out. So we can detect all these eye movements thanks to EOGs and EEGs. And LaBerge, um, you know, Keith Hearn, um, I don't think published his results right away. Hearn, uh, LaBerge uh, ended up getting published um, and has since used uh, these methods to study the mind-body relationship. Um, with a focus on what happens during sleep and dreaming. So like I just mentioned, the subjective sense of, uh, the, subjective sense of the passage of time is interesting because uh, we've been, it's been found that um, 
time seems to pass at about the same rate in dreams as in real life. And the really interesting thing is that this has implications for the spontaneous memory insertion theory or the cassette theory. So think about it. I go into the sleep lab. I realize I'm dreaming. I make my eye movements. Then I do some experiments. I count to 10. So I signal when I start counting, then I signal when I finish counting. I do squats or push-ups or something. So I'll make a signal when I start, I'll do the push-ups or the squats, signal when I finish. And then I wake up and I give my subjective report, which matches uh, what is uh, on the EEG and the polygraph and the EOG and all of that. What does that seem to suggest? That we're using similar areas of the brain when we dream as opposed to in reality? Uh, yeah, well, well, we're using similar areas of the brain, but, but that's not really what's at issue if we're talking about Dennett's um, cassette theory. Because remember, Dennett's cassette theory is spontaneous memory insertion. So when I'm in REM sleep uh, on Dennett's theory, I'm not having an experience. Instead, my brain is composing a narrative. And then it's popped in when I wake up such that it feels like I had this experience. That's what Dennett's saying. So what does LaBerge's work imply for that view? So if dreams are, if dreams seem to be happening in real time, could they be spontaneous memory insertions? Yes, Daniel nailed it. These dreams anyway, these lucid ones are happening in real time. They can't be composed after the fact. So I don't think that this is a difference that makes no difference. This is a difference that absolutely would make a difference. If Dennett was right, could we have lucid dreams? In, and, and could we see them play out in real time? Right? All this is, a, is to say that I, I, Dennett's idea is really cool as a thought experiment uh, against Cartesian uh, ways of thinking. Um, uh, but I don't think it captures how dreams actually work. It's really more of a thought experiment. Um, and we can even do more advanced stuff now. Uh, LaBerge is using EEG, EOG, that kind of thing. We could do this with fMRI if we wanted to, um, which I think must be awfully difficult because um, the fMRI machines are loud. I would be worried about people waking up. Uh, like you put the dreaming person in the fMRI and they get woken up and they wake up and ah, I'm in the MRI. Ah, let me out. Like, um, so, but they've done it. Some, some researchers, researchers have done this and we can see the dreaming brain in real time. We can see visual areas, auditory areas, all this stuff happening, which seems uh, congruent with the idea that dreams happen in real time that they are experiences. I mean, everybody, everybody got me so far? Everybody see what I mean? I think so. Yeah. I've been, I've been like mashing, like seriously, like mashing my keyboard as you were speaking. But yeah, <laughs> I think I got it. <laughs> awesome. Jean-Francois is still not sure. Tell me what's up. What's the, uh, what's, uh, what's the, the thing that's causing the wheels to turn? We're not turning in this case. Yeah, the gears are all jammed up. Need some grease. Um, all right. So let's go back and think what Dennett is actually saying, right? Okay. Dennett is saying that when you're having, when you're, when you're in REM sleep, you're not mm -hmm. having a dream. Your brain is composing a dream narrative. Okay. As opposed to lucid dreaming. Well, just just take dreams, just, just regular okay. dreams. Um. So. We think that uh, nowadays, I think most people would agree, uh, you know, most people would share the intuition that dreams are experiences, even if we're not lucid, right? Like if you have a dream, 
you're in the dream and it's happening and it's an experience. Mm -hmm. What Dennett was saying is if I had, if you never had that dream, but somebody composed that dream and put it on a tape and popped it in when you woke up. So it seemed like you had an experience, but you didn't. I'm just like recollecting a bunch of different memories. Yeah. It's kind of like if I was like some kind of super duper brain programmer scientist. And I okay. programmed a day at Canada's Wonderland. Um, and I plugged it into your brain and you're like, wow, I remember the, my day at Canada's Wonderland. But you were never there. Mm -hmm. That's what Dennett is saying dreams are. But I'm saying that I don't think it can be that way. Because as right. Daniel said, Dennett is saying dreams are not experiences that unfold over time. They're a memory insertion. But this stuff seems to show that dreams unfold in real time, which seems to imply they are experiences, in fact. Yeah, because the cassette theory doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. Now, remember, uh, remember, this is the caveat. I don't think this is meant to be like how Dennett thinks dreams actually work. This is a way of explaining how you can have conscious experience without the mental theater, right? The idea that there is a special place in the brain where consciousness happens, where there is an audience, you, yourself, and the screen or stage, the experience. That's what Dennett is trying to defeat. But let's not think that this is how dreams actually work, because I don't think that's how they work. Now we're almost at the end. I figured I'd bring up out-of-body experiences uh, just briefly because we will talk about those next time. But out-of-body experiences are probably pretty similar to lucid dreams. Uh, they may even be lucid dreams. An out-of-body experience occurs when you have the experience of leaving your body. I wonder, has anyone had one? I've had lucid dreams, but I've never had an out-of-body experience. Okay, interesting. Darn, I was hoping maybe somebody had, but... Like, I've had dreams I woke up where I was just, I was viewing myself sleep or viewing myself at a different place. Then I wake up, like, oh, shit, no, I was just sleeping. Yeah, so, yeah. so uh, many out-of-body experiences may be exactly that, may be dreams. Um, uh, I've, I've, I've put this paper up. It's not really a paper, it's an article. Really, I'd like you to read it for the next class by Leviton and Leberge. Um, so I won't talk about it in much detail, but I will say that they both argue that um, out-of-body experiences are probably dreams, or if they're not dreams, they're very similar phenomena to dreams. Um, they seem to be related to false awakenings. Who's had a false awakening? Does anyone know what that is? When you wake up in your dream, you're still in a dream. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. All the time. Yeah. So a false awakening can be an unnerving experience. I very rarely have them, but there's one account in the in this chapter of the textbook um, where there's some guy who who's woken up because he's got a patient. I think he's a physician or something. And so he's washing his face and washing his hands and he splashes the water on his face and then he wakes up. It's like, oh, it was a dream. And he goes through this like four or five times before he wakes up for real, um, which uh, also it's a trope used in a lot of movies, especially like thrillers and horror movies. You know, you wake up and something happens and, and it's like, oh, shit, I didn't actually wake up. It was still a dream. Like, um, so it's a very cool plot device you see used a lot. Um. They're related to false awakenings because you could dream that you've woken up and then perhaps that dream would continue into some kind of out-of-body experience. Um, um, they can also occur as a result of sleep paralysis, uh, which I've mentioned before. Um, sleep paralysis is a very interesting phenomenon that occurs when you partially wake up, but your body is still paralyzed um in REM sleep um but but you're awake you're awake but your brain is still is in is still in REM sleep so you can't move so you know you wake up and you're stuck 
and you're like, what the hell? This is crazy. Uh, often people will feel a pressure on their chest too. Again, because your muscles are paralyzed. You can breathe, but you can't like, you know, like really like move around like you can when you're fully awake. Um, and you hallucinate because you're still dreaming. Your brain is still dreaming. Uh, very often you, you will slip back into sleep very quickly, but your, you, the dream that you will be in will be very similar to the environment you woke up in. So you might dream that you're in your bedroom paralyzed and then all of a sudden some aliens come or a demon or, or something, right? They used to call this in, in dark age Europe, they called this the old hag phenomenon. Uh, and they thought that it was a demon. So um, if it happened to uh, if it happened to women, they would blame it on the incubus, which was a male demon who wanted to um, get freaky with unsuspecting humans. And for the men, they would meet the succubus, which is the female version of the incubus, a, a, a sexual demon who just wants to come and have her way with you in the night. This is, of course, during the Dark Ages when belief in demons was uh, widespread. Nowadays, you're much more likely to hear of alien abductions. You know, again, I can't move. I was taken up into their ship and they showed me some star charts and then I woke up and I was in my bed like nothing had happened. Or I've even heard uh, visitations of dead loved ones, uh, ghosts which again, um, plausible, uh, plausible way for sleep paralysis to go. And of course, an out-of-body experience or astral projection, right, could, could, also, could also occur if, you're, if, you, if you find yourself uh, stuck with a case of sleep paralysis. The number one thing is if you find yourself experiencing sleep paralysis, there's no need to panic. It's a natural thing that happens to you multiple times every night it's just that usually you're not awake for it usually you're in REM sleep the cool thing about it is is that if you find yourself in a state of sleep paralysis you can very easily enter a lucid dream hi toots what are you doing yeah you can very easily enter a lucid dream because you're already halfway there you just kind of have to remember not to panic let yourself fall back asleep um, and you may find yourself uh, able to move and then you can, you can figure out whether you're dreaming or not. But we'll talk more about astral projection, out-of-body experiences, and that stuff next time. So why do we dream? Well, I guess we still don't really know, right? They might be epiphenomenal. They might be a spandrel. Maybe dreaming is just a free rider on brains that can do all of the stuff that our brains can do. Our brains can perceive the world, imagine, we can problem solve, can remember things. Dreams might just be an unintentional byproduct of brains that can do that. Dreams might be important for learning though, right? If it's threat simulation or mental play, it's important for testing, formulating concepts, maybe moving information around memory consolidation like Hobson says so I'm like defragmenting my internal hard drive every night when I dream um, maybe they have no purpose or maybe they have many purposes or maybe we think we can give them our own purpose you know a lot of people are curious about interpreting dreams I think that since dreams are not letters to yourself from yourself or letters from spirits or gods or ancestors that we can't really interpret dreams that way. But I do think that dreams can still tell us something about ourselves. Um, you know, uh, there are things that I dream about that seem to reveal things about my mood, right? And I'm not the best at paying attention to how I'm doing with my mental health, right? I'm kind of one of those people that will just be like, I'm fine until I'm like really not fine. Um, so I try to be better at that. And one of the ways that I know that I'm maybe a little more anxious or, or neurotic than I'd like to admit is if I have a strange anxiety dream. If there's fish, weird fish under the water. Uh, 
dirty bathrooms are another one. Yeah, dirty bathrooms. Um, like the bathrooms at Carlton, you know, like uh, I think there's like one nice bathroom. It's like the 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 uh, the gender neutral bathroom by Roosters is like super nice. All the other bathrooms are like the horrible bathrooms from my dreams. Um, a lot of people also have dreams about their teeth. Yeah. Anyone ever have a dream where their, their teeth are all messed up or their teeth are falling out? Yeah. Jean Francois has. A lot of people have those. And 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 that's 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 for some reason that's a common, a seemingly common anxiety dream. It's having your teeth fall out. Why? Well, maybe because this is like how we show ourselves to like, hi, I'm Josh. Here's my face. But if all my teeth are falling out, well, that's not good. Alexis, go ahead. Uh, now that you mentioned it, I, I have heard about, I think what it's supposed to symbolize, I can't remember, but like if I were to look it up, I'm pretty sure there's a, a reason that they always tell you for when your teeth are falling out or something. Yeah. But, now, um, uh, I mean, I, no, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say that I don't think there are reliable dream semantics right like i don't think that you can you know you need to go to the bookstore and if you go to the new age section they'll have a book like how to interpret your dreams and it's like if you dream this this is what it means but like no like it's it, it's that's not how it works but if i get to know my own dreams maybe i can glean something about my mental life from that that is but that's not interpreting them i don't think but continue. Oh, yeah. No, I just had a, a quick question. Um, since we're talking about like why do we dream in different reasons or we're not sure why, um, do you think it's possible that, especially maybe if you're not like religious, maybe if, like if you're like um, an atheist or something like that, do you think dreams possibly serve to indicate to us that we're not dead? Like if we don't believe in like the afterlife or something, then is it possible that being asleep just like dreams are a way for you to know that you're not dead yet i mean maybe like if 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 you're if when your brain is falling asleep it, it thinks it's dying and and like gives you a myoclonic jerk maybe i mean maybe <laughs> i mean i know that i know for example that if you didn't sleep you would go crazy and and so i think that probably dreams are a part of that not going crazy right one of the ways that the soviet union would torture people um during the cold war was sleep deprivation and you know they would just keep you awake and maybe they'd let you sleep and and wake you up uh if you started dreaming um yeah yeah like jean francois says their sleep experiments um yeah like the soviets would uh, they didn't need a waterboard or do the fingernail things or anything like that. They just, they just wouldn't let you sleep and you'd lose your mind. Um, I don't know if anyone has seen um, anybody with an addiction to stimulants. Um, hang on, toots. But um, I have. Uh, so, for example, uh, in my days when I worked at Tim Hortons next to the homeless shelter, uh, a lot of the people who are experiencing homelessness um, also have substance use problems. Uh, and of course, we have the opioid e epidemic, but there are also stimulants out there. And uh, I, I, I have to admit, I don't know what some of these folks were using. I, I really don't know. I suspect it could have been anything. It could have been just some random chemicals mixed up in someone's garage in a bucket for all I know. Um, I don't know if it was bath salts or crack cocaine or methamphetamine, um, but some of these folks um, will binge on a stimulant for days and, and they don't sleep and they start talking to people who aren't there right like they 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 begin they enter psychosis and the drug use can contribute to that but 
in the like chronically that can be a problem but acutely it's the lack of sleep um uh i i i heard a similar account um recently my partner and i watched um it's a really good documentary on george carlin the the comedian on hbo it's george carlin's american dream it's two part it's really good um anyway george carlin um uh was a bit of a cokehead um and um he would uh recount how he would go on these binges where he remembered like talking to people who weren't there because he'd, he'd go like five days without any sleep. And um, yeah, oh yeah, Freud too. Freud was a cocaine user, but not later in his life. He gave it up, you know? Um, and that's the thing with like 18th and 19th century drugs. Um, you'd get people who, who were like, opium is great. I'm going to write a book about it, how awesome opium is. And then they die an opium addict or, or like Freud, who's like when he was, yeah, when he was young, the cocaine papers, when he was younger, he's like, cocaine is awesome. And then when he got older, he was like, I need to stop doing cocaine. So yeah. So that's why all this stuff is illegal now, because before people were like, this is great. Of course they were, but you know, after a while, you know, and Freud with cigars too. Freud smoked cigars all the time, thought cigars are great. Freud died of oral cancer. Yeah, he got like cancer of the of the mouth and the tongue and everything. And what a way to go. I mean, oh, so d- just don't do that, you know. Um, but the, but psychosis uh, is a real risk if you don't sleep. And I, I'd be willing to bet that if you, uh, like in the epilepsy um, sleep, um, study that Dahlia was describing I bet that if you subjected people to that over a long period of time where you never let them hit REM sleep I bet that there would be some adverse effects there as well and perhaps if there's somebody who's done one of these uh stints in the sleep lab uh I know that I if I don't get enough sleep I am just awful um like- Going on the three day speed bender, uh, I was seeing like bugs out of the corner of my eyes. I was seeing, did you, have you seen the Lion King, the movie? Uh, oh, the original of the Disney? The good one, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah not so the live the action. They have, like, <laughs> the cave, I haven't seen the new one, the live action. But uh, oh, there's like these cave, uh, there's like shadow, like shadow people, and they're kind of, it's like stop motion animations. I was seeing that those people running the well, well, like when the car. hyenas are singing yeah 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 yeah, yeah. so I, I saw that on the side of my car um oh you geez. just you hear things that you don't you're not supposed to be hearing you know it's all messed up like your, your response is delayed to things it's just uh yeah it's, in the, it's hellish it's well, it just goes to hellish. show you you know three days without sleep is is serious i think I after th- two you start develop you go into like micro sleep your brain just shuts off like a fraction of a second at a time or something I, like that. maybe to, yeah. the only time the only time i i've ever been awake i i was when i was working on my master's thesis i was awake for about 50 hours straight at one point um oh, wow. the only yeah. stimulant i had was caffeine and nicotine mind you but i right. was i was just pounding oh. the coffee my stomach hurt like I was going Uh, for I it was cigarettes at the time not a vape so I was um always coughing um and nothing crazy happened but I remember like I I did start to shut down and and I I I, I'm like it's this I can't I can't continue it has to sleep it's time for sleep or I'm gonna lose it so um, it's uh yeah everything starts going awry and like even like regulation of body temperature just so many different things that happen um, oh yeah yeah like yeah. um so definitely it, it's very important to get a good night's sleep every night it's sleep hygiene i i got a whole sheet on sleep hygiene here i don't do any of the stuff but I mean, <laughs> well versed in it <laughs> yeah well versed i mean you can tell like even if uh if like after like like alcohol has this interesting effect where um alcohol results in something called rem rebound where um you know if if you've ever been on you know a pub crawl or a party you come home you've had a couple of drinks and you're you're pretty smashed and you go to sleep you fall asleep pretty quickly but 
you go into deep sleep and you don't really come back up into REM sleep until much later. And the result is that you get a really long REM period at the end of the night, which can result in very vivid, strange dreams. Um, okay. But even though you're falling asleep faster, um, because you're not hitting the proper cycles, you're not waking up as rested. So, you know, you, you can go out night at the bar, get hammered, you go home and you're like, I'm ready for, for bed. I'm going to sleep like a baby. And you might sleep like 10, 12 hours, uh, but you're not going to feel rested the next day because you haven't gone through the proper cycles. Uh, mm -hmm. So alcohol does that. And cannabis can also do that as well. So, you know, if you're having that nightcap or something to try and get to sleep, just remember that it, not too much, because if you have too much, yeah, you'll get to sleep fast, but it won't be a restful sleep and you'll wake up feeling very tired the next day. So. But as for how to have a lucid dream, uh, number one, read this book or go on the internet. There's lots of cool things uh, that you can look at. There is some bunk there though. You have to be careful. You know, you can find websites and communities that are like, you know, here's the um, mnemonic induction of lucid dreaming technique from Stephen LaBerge and they'll give you that. But then they'll also have a page on finding your spirit guide or talking to, dead relatives and um i think that's fine as long as it hasn't been appropriated you know some people do, some people come from cultural backgrounds where spirit guides are real or where ancestors or gods or spirits tell you stuff in your dreams and that's fine that's part of who you are um but a lot of that gets appropriated by new age people and 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 again sold at the bookstore um or on a, on a website. And, and I think that's kind of slimy, you know? So um, you just watch out for the bunk. Uh, but one thing you need to do if you're going to have lucid dreams is improve your dream recall because that's difficult to do, recalling dreams. So what you need to do is get better at recalling your dreams. Most people recommend keeping a journal uh, where as soon as you wake up, you just write down whatever you remember and over time, that practice will get you so that you're better at remembering dreams. Um, you want to also try to lie still when you wake up. Try not to move. Try not to think too much. Try and get in that habit of, what was I, you know, ask yourself, what was I just dreaming about? If nothing comes to you, fine. You know, with practice, you'll get there. So you keep a record. And um, once you recall about one dream every night, uh, you can begin to look at what is dreamlike about your dreams. Everybody has peculiar, interesting things about their dreams that are dreamlike, which are not like waking life. That'll be particular to you. For me, it's my weird dream house, giant fish, stuff like that, right? For you, it might be something else. But you want to find what's dreamlike about it. Then in your waking life, you need to develop a habit of reality testing. Unless you're a philosopher, which some of you are, you know, you probably don't do this kind of thing very often. You probably don't question your, you know, you ask most people randomly off the street, have you ever questioned your reality? Most of them will say no. Uh, when I was a teenager, I questioned my reality multiple times a day, every day, just to get better at this. So what you want to do is uh, once you've got a list of things that's dreamlike about your dreams, whenever you see something similar in your real life, you want to ask yourself whether it's possible that you might actually be dreaming. Um, so if I dream of weird fish, then I don't know, maybe I'm at the grocery store and I pass the seafood section. Oh, fish. Hey, could this be a dream? You know, and I want to ask that. But how could you tell if it were a dream? I mean, when we're dreaming, we often can't tell if it's a dream. So how could I tell right now if I was in the dream? Like, I'll ask my question, am I dreaming or am I awake? How could I know? There's lots of different ways. And is, there... it, is it true? Like the whole thing about like, you know, something about fingers, um, the amount of fingers or something that you have, or I know you're saying pinching yourself is a, not really a... Sometimes. Uh, sometimes if you look at your hands, they'll be weird. Like you'll have more fingers or the number of fingers is changing. Isn't it because your brain has a problem with like 
developing complex images when you're dreaming or like something like that? Or, uh, it's you know? not a problem of complex images. It's just the fact that there's no stable representation of a hand here. Oh, right. So faces and yeah. It's, it's internal. Yeah. yeah, not external. So that's true. It is true that pinching yourself is not a good way to do it because you can feel pain in dreams. And if you're dreaming and you pinch yourself, you'll probably just feel a pinch. So don't pinch yourself. But yes, you can look at your hands. Another cool thing you can do with your hands is uh, try and push your finger through your hand. You can't do that in waking life because your hands are solid. But if you're dreaming, there is no spoon, right? You push that finger all the way through your hand if you want to. You can also, uh, here's a fun one, plug your nose and keep your mouth closed and try to breathe through your nose while it's plugged. Careful, you might pop your ears. You can't do that if you're awake, but if you're dreaming, you can, because you're not really plugging any physical nose. So you'll plug your nose and find you're, you're perfectly able to breathe. Um, the two big ones are reading text or numbers. This is incredibly difficult to do in dreams. Uh, often people report that letters and numbers are all jumbled up, nothing makes sense. And what I could do if I was uh, dreaming, for example, is I could read this, exploring the world of lucid dreaming, look away and look back. And if I'm dreaming, that's going to say something else, if it even says something at all. Why? Again, no stable representation that's built on a stable external world. <laughs> Maybe. Well, dyslexics might miss this maybe if they were in a dream. But what dyslexics could do is use the light switch test. Um, <laughs> so like you can, uh, so electronic devices are notoriously unreliable in dreams, again, because there's no actual external world. Uh, so light switches um, are a great way to test if you're dreaming. Just try and flick the light switch on and off. I've done this before and, and I'm, I flick the switch and the lights go on and off, but they go slower than I'm flicking the switch, which is weird. Sometimes the light switch doesn't work at all. Um, so those are all different ways that you can check to see whether your conscious experience is being driven by a stable external world and sensory information coming from there or whether it's coming from internally. And if it's internal, chances are it's a dream or you have a bad electrician. <laughs> um, a couple more things. Another thing is to try and remember what you were doing. Um, if, I, if I think back what I was doing today, I can remember back until the moment I woke up. I was, uh, let's see, I've been teaching this. We had a break. I was teaching a uh, little prep, little emails before. Before that, I took the dog to the park. Uh, before that, I had some coffee, caught up with the news, and that would have been about the time I got out of bed. So I can remember all the way back. Uh, but if you're dreaming, do you think that'll work? Yeah, no. You'll you'll eventually come upon a gap. You'll be like, I was uh, I was doing this, and then I was doing this, and wait a minute. Before that, I was going to bed. Oh, I'm dreaming, Blah, you know? So there's lots of ways to do it. Um, now, the more you do this while awake becomes a habit. And the more you do it, the more that habit has the probability of carrying over into your dreams so that when you have something weird in your dream, you remember to check and you do a reality test when you're actually dreaming. And if you do it right, you realize it's a dream. There's also uh, uh, something to be said for trying to do this at the optimal time. Um, afternoon naps or when you're sleeping in, like on the weekend, are better times to have lucid dreams because you can sleep longer, have more REM periods, and just increase the chances of recognizing a dream for a dream. And there are techniques you can practice as well. This one, the mnemonic induction of lucid dreams, is covered in the chapter on uh, from Blackmore. So you can just go and, and read that. It's also in here. 
This is the technique LeBerge used for his PhD research. Essentially, the long and short of it is you go to sleep, sleep, get up from a dream. You wake up for just a bit, just enough to kind of clear the fog out. And then you go back to sleep. You've written the dream down, hopefully. And then you also rehearse the dream again. You keep going over the same dream again. But this time you imagine that you recognize it's a dream and you keep doing that until you fall asleep. And chances are you'll find yourself back in that dream realizing it's a dream. Um, there's also uh, wake induced lucid dreams when you try to enter the dream directly. So uh, some people will do this by watching their hypnagogic imagery, which will gradually turn into a give way to a dream. Um, the way I like to do it is count. So same with mild technique, you, you get up out of a dream, you stay still, you try and fall back asleep. But as you're falling asleep, you count one, I'm dreaming, two, I'm dreaming, three, I'm dreaming. Eventually, and I've had this happen. Uh, I find myself in a dream where I'm counting and someone's like, why are you counting? And I'm like, so I remember I'm dreaming. Oh, wait. Oh, okay. Got it. I'm dreaming now. So uh, those are some ways you can do it. And again, there's lots of other techniques, but you just have to watch out for the bunk for the flim flam on the internet. So that's it for today. Next time I'd like to discuss out of body experiences and a related uh, paranormal phenomenon known as astral projection. And this will get us into our discussion on reality shifting, because when we're talking about out-of-body experiences, we're talking about the experience of leaving one's physical body. Astral projection, we're talking about projecting the mind purportedly to other planes of existence, other dimensions. So we're dealing with other dimensions, other realities here. And that'll get us into reality shifting and the Mandela effect. For the Mandela effect, I'm going to try and kill two birds with one stone here. Uh, we'll learn about it and how it might explain why some, you know, why are there some of these reality shifting trends on TikTok and Reddit, Twitter and all of that. But also the reading, which I will post uh, after this lecture. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's true. Well, it's true. You know, anything like lucid dreams are like an altered state of consciousness that you can have without taking drugs, which is appealing to a lot of people, right? Not everybody wants to put a chemical in their body. But if you use discipline and hard work and practice, you can have lucid dreams. And that's, that's awesome. You know, um, so we've got uh, reality shifting. Uh, uh, what I'm going to do here is we're going to learn about the Mandela effect, like I was saying, but also the reading that I'm going to have you read is also uh, actually a paper that one of my former students wrote for the very first iteration of this class. I'm going to have you read one of the one of the papers that a student, of, a former student of mine, Liam Burke, wrote on the Mandela effect. Um, this has the benefit of uh, getting you uh, to learn about the Mandela effect, but also you will see what an A-plus paper looks like in this class. And I think that will come in very handy for all of you when it comes to writing your own paper. So that's why we'll be doing that. So thanks, of course, to Liam for doing that. Uh, it's a good paper, and I'll, I'll put a version of it up on Brightspace shortly. Uh, but that's the plan for next time. Um, and that's all I have for today. So hopefully you're excited about dreams and you have a bit more of an appreciation of how they work. Maybe you have an interest in having a lucid dream. Um, and maybe, uh, maybe you appreciate how dreams have gone from supernatural, paranormal, parapsychological to pretty much, you know, not completely understood, but quite well understood. If uh, you see what happens once we understand something, it stops being parapsychology. Oh, well. Lucid dreams are still pretty cool. So that's all. Uh, let's, let's end it for today, and I'll get this lecture uploaded, and I'll see you all on Thursday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Bye. thanks, everyone. Bye. End transmission.